let's get started. So welcome back to another SLAM uh, seminar. What we have today is a, is a, a, a double pair, a double pair, that's not wrong, it's <laughs> a pair, a double SLAM. That sounds like something from uh, World Wrestling Federation. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, we have two, two speakers who are going to talk about kind of specific projects around, uh, around trying to quantify what goes on with teaching and learning. And the first speaker is going to be Bill Gehring, who works on human brain electrophysiology, and in particular, the electrical pulses in the brain that are associated with those oops moments that you have. So I was interested to learn that something happens when you have that oops moment, other than what comes out of your mouth. Um, <laughs> do you know whether this happened for, um, for the man from Texas? When he said oops? I can almost guarantee it did. <laughs> okay, that experience tells. Right. Bill is a third out professor, and he's been teaching for a while Psych 240, which is Intro to Cognitive Psych, right? And it's a big class, 450 mm -hmm. or something like that, students. Uh, taught all in one bunch. Mm -hmm. So you must be an 1800 chem because there's no other place really That's right. that big. Yeah. And um, he's been trying to understand what leads to student success in that class. And when we break in between, I'll introduce our second speaker, Denise, second quapula. Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me. I was uh, excited to find out about this group um, because uh, I think that, well, I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to get a lot of good advice. Um, I want to preface this by saying that what you're hearing today is very preliminary and very non-scholarly. So uh, I'm just going to give the outlines of this project and in um, some details about what I found in some data analysis during just the past couple weeks since exam one. Um, just to give you a bit of background, the class is Introduction to Cognitive Psychology and the basic subject matter is all of the basic topics in uh, human uh, cognition, perception, attention, memory, problem solving, reason, decision making. And the motivation for this survey, well partly it was born of failure, that uh, last semester I had a, a class assignment that was just a disaster and so I needed to do something to replace it midstream and so I thought well it'd be interesting to find out some of the stuff uh, that I'm trying to look at in this survey. Um, I've been trying to teach explicitly some techniques for good studying in the class and so the aim of the survey was in part to see how well these techniques are actually working for students. Uh, one of the motivations for the uh, project is this experience which many of you have probably had where after exam one uh, students will come into class and say um, I knew the material well, I studied real hard, and I didn't do well on the exam. And part of the puzzle is trying to understand what happens with those people. Um, commonly, the response when I ask them, well, how did you prepare, is I went over the notes and I reread the chapter. And I think, as we'll see, that that probably isn't the most effective thing to do. Uh, a couple other questions I've had are laptops in the classroom helping. Uh, partly this is motivated by uh, when I gave a, I had to present a movie because I had laryngitis last semester and so I sat in the back of the room and even during the movie about 40% of the class had their laptops open. I'd say about 80% of those were on ESPN. Um, and actually there was one point where I went into the audience, into the class, and the guy right next to me, who knew I was there, I mean, wasn't looking at porn, but it was something very close on the order of Victoria's Secret. I thought, well, something's going on when people are looking at laptops that isn't related to the class. Is that helping? Is that hurting? And finally, I was curious about podcasts. I've noticed that podcasting can cut down on class attendance, and uh, I handled podcasts a lot differently last semester than this semester. This semester, I actually gave a lot of uh, extra credit for clickers in the classroom, and attendance is back up. I'm trying to find out whether people substituting podcasts for lectures is actually hurting their performance. So the survey that I've uh, begun in the class, uh, I. Uh, start to administer after lecture number three. And lecture number three is a lecture where I introduce all of the techniques for effective studying based on research from cognitive psychology. Um, and I list them here, I'll just briefly mention them. Uh, generating material on your own where you have to, you know, draw things from memory um, without being prompted, without having to recognize. Uh, varying the conditions of learning, studying in different areas, uh, not always studying in the same place so that your learning isn't tied to a particular context. Uh, providing 
contextual interference, which is studying uh, many topics um, going from one to the other rather than studying in block fashion where you study one topic for a long period of time and then move to another topic. Uh, Research has found if you mix things up, you'll learn all of them better. Uh, a couple important ones are uh, spacing your study st sessions so that if you, rather than cramming all of your study sessions into one interval, um, a single interval, space them out over time. And in particular for students, this means how soon before the exam do you actually start to study for the exam. Final, probably the most important one, is testing yourself using some kind of testing technique um, rather than simply going over material as a way to learn the material. So if you devise a way to quiz you yourself, if you have a friend test you, um, all of these things give you a sense for how well you know the material, comprehension check on whether you're understanding it. Well, those things have been shown to improve classroom, uh, in, improve memory in memory tests, but there's actually very little data from real world classes. Uh, so every week after this first lecture then on studying techniques, I give students a survey that I make available Friday morning, my lectures on Thursday, and I ask them to complete it as soon as they can, uh, Monday morning at the latest. And it's worth a big chunk of their class grade. So what do I include on the survey? Well, there are a number of things specifically related to these study habits. And this is a Likert scale survey for the most part, asking things, do you recopy your notes? Do you reread material? Uh, what kinds of, or do you use self-testing? Do you use flashcards as a way of self-testing? Uh, when you go through the material, do you create outlines and diagrams based on the material that you're um, studying? Uh, there's these things called desirable difficulties that the psychologist Robert Bjork has identified, which are some of the things that I described earlier, that are things that sort of make it difficult and unpleasant to study but actually help you in the long run. So generating material on your own from memory without cues, uh, interleaving topics, a thing that I've already mentioned, varying conditions. There are a number of things related to how well you regulate your study. Do you th do things specifically to minimize distractions? I have a few things related to that on the survey. I have a few things related to the use of classroom resources. So uh, do people make use of podcasts? Uh, are they using the PowerPoint downloads? Are they using PDF readings? And interestingly, I also now have some data from C-Tools, which I haven't begun to analyze yet, which will give me a quantitative, um, you know, objective measure of that, not simply relying on student self-report. I have a few items related to student motivation. And uh, I think uh, we'll see how that's important uh, in a few minutes. And then finally, just some basic demographics. Um, I ask about GPA. Um, and every week I might throw in something different just to sort of um, you know, assess various other factors that seem to occur to me. So the measures that I have available are the survey results. Um, I'm not using lecture tools this semester, but last semester I did. Um, this semester I'm using clickers, so I actually have day-by-day um, -day, uh, assessments of students' understanding of material from class. Uh, the C-Tools usage statistics that I mentioned earlier. And I also have some results from actual cognitive tests because one of the parts of the class is a computerized testing bank that allows students to try out different kinds of cognitive tasks. And some of them that are especially important are working memory. How much information can you contain in your memory for a short period of time? Um, there are a number of established uh, uh, tests that people use that these seem to be related to uh, fluid intelligence. Uh, there's some memory... Um, measures of attention. I actually haven't been, begun to analyze these yet either. So, Does every student do those? Or do you, you made it sound like they kind of pick and choose? Or? Um, for these, there's a weekly assignment where every student does yeah. them. So there is an option where they can skip one, um, but it's in most people's best interest to keep up. And uh, so, so that will be available. Excuse me. Yes. And for those, the, both the survey and those cognitive tests, um, that they do them is required, but are they anonymized so the results don't affect their grade? Do you know what I mean? What they tell you they're doing or how well they perform on these tests aren't related to the grade? They're not anonymized, and I tell people that they're not anonymized, and I also tell them that I'm the only one that has access to the individual data. Um, I need some way to cross, you know, correlate uh, exam scores with these uh, other data, and they're but they're probably then not real motivated to 
necessarily be accurate about how much they're doing the things that you've told them they should be doing? Um, the fact that I'm finding relationships suggests that there is something going on. I mean, there are going to be some ways to check on this using C tool yes. statistics and things like that, but that's an important point. Um, so some predictors that have shown up so far, uh, well, I think as you've heard about in here already, uh, GPA is a huge predictor. So this is exam one score, uh, and just the Pearson correlation with GPA is 0.57. So there's a quite high relationship between overall GPA and exam score. Uh, there are a few things that have turned up in my preliminary analysis, and again, I want to highlight this caveat at the bottom of the screen, that this is all very preliminary. So um, these are things that appear to be somewhat consistent, but uh, again, I should uh, you know mention that these might change. Uh, one of these is that um, there are some good things that appear to help in exam performance. One of these, and probably one of the most robust, is testing yourself. So students who report always or almost always te uh, using uh, techniques to test themselves tended to do better on the exam. Um, one thing that didn't turn up this semester but did last semester, and I'm not quite sh uh, sure why this is, is exercises that require students to generate information on their own. So if you draw an axis and have to fill it out from memory on your own, um, the relationship isn't as strong, but it was very robust last semester. I'm not quite sure why that's inconsistent. Uh, a couple very important ones, which I'm going to show you graphs of in a second, are not waiting until the last minute to study, so spreading your studying out over a period of time before the exam, and studying a lot. So the students who worked harder tended to do better on the exams. There are some things that appear to be not good things to do. Uh, one is underlining or highlighting. So if students report always or almost always underlining or highlighting in their studying, it's not a very good technique. Uh, listening to podcasts is showing up as not helpful in studying, and I'm not quite sure why that is. Most students are attending lectures, so if they're listening to podcasts, it's a supplement to lecture. Um, but um, I'm not sure I understand what's going on there. Probably, it might have to do with different uses of podcasts. So are you selectively going through and reviewing specific things versus just listening from beginning to end, which is sort of like going over notes, I think. Um, using flashcards tends not to be helpful. And this has shown up not only in this semester's data, but also some data from last semester and some studies in the literature. Uh, flashcards in and of themselves don't seem to be all that helpful. What may be the case is that students will drop flashcards too soon when they're studying so that they get it right the first time through a deck of cards and then they don't study that one anymore. Studying with friends isn't good. Uh, at least this, this uh, one item on the, in the survey, now I suspect that studying with friends probably depends on how you study with friends. Uh, are you are you ask, asking questions of friends, or are you just hanging out with your friends, drinking coffee and studying? Does it just say, do you study with friends? Uh, something like that. Something yeah. similar. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't probed that in any more depth. Yes. What are you asking them to do on examples? Definitions or higher level? Uh, it's a combination. I, there are multiple choice exams, but my uh, exams tend to be fairly conceptual. So they're applying a concept to a new situation. Um, uh, you know, there are some definitional kinds of things, but most students who approach it with the, with the idea that they're just memorizing definitions don't do so well. Uh, things that haven't turned out to be significant are recopying, rereading re the notes. Those don't, there didn't seem to be a good or bad one way or the other. Last semester it didn't appear to be helpful. Uh, varying the conditions of learning and interleaving topics, both of those desirable difficulties didn't seem to have an effect. Now, I just need to ask how I'm doing on time. Do you, Bill, while we're doing that, yeah. is it possible that there are multi-modes in the class? And I can imagine there are a bunch of, some students who really don't need to study, they're going to get a good grade. The, and there are the weaker students who, for where, where you might see more relationships. With, so. Yes, that's, that's an important uh, next step in the analysis to try and, and tease that apart, right? So that take the A students and see how these things line up versus the, you know, lower scoring students. Um, just to point out a couple of these things about studying hard. So um, these, uh, this shows the effect of spacing out your studying prior to the exam. So um, 
The question asked, uh, for this exam, I did most of my studying and then it gave some options. Um, starting soon after lecture was, meaning as soon as you get the lecture on that material, you start studying in preparation for the exam. Eight to 14 days, this was about a um, little over two weeks since the beginning of the semester when the exam happened. Um, if that's when most of the ex studying started, that was uh, the second category then. Three to seven days was the three to seven days just prior to the exam. Two to three days is the two to three days just prior to the exam and 24 hours is then waiting until the day before the exam. Uh, the numbers in parentheses are the numbers of students who reported those very uh, levels. And the uh, exam score is the uh, exam score. So you can see that uh, there is a relationship between spacing out your studying prior to the exam and how well you do on the exam. Now, of course, you know, as in any of this stuff that I'm telling you today, in, in inferring causality is, is different than actually showing the relationship. But it indicates that if you're going to encourage someone what to do, that it's probably good to encourage them to start studying right away and actually not wait until the day before the exam. But then this is a fairly robust finding in the literature as well. Can we get a copy of this to show in our classes? Uh, you, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um. This is the estimate for the number of hours spent studying. This is just from the week prior to the exam. And so zero to two hours. Uh, two to three, three to four, four to six, all the way up to 20 plus, there's a relationship there. There's a little bit of a drop off for the 20 plus people and, and um, I'm not sure if this is uh, a meaningful drop off, but you can see that studying more does help in exam performance, um, as you might suspect. Maybe those uh, are the kids who wish they'd 20 hours, okay. they'd study. <laughs> well, I'm kind of curious, I have an I have a item on anxiety, and I'm kind of curious that when you start to get up to that level, you may yeah. be tapping some people yeah. who have suffered from it. We, we see something very similar in business classes. People yeah. who report enormous amounts of study who work. Yeah. And they may not be telling you the truth, who knows, but they're yeah. really. And one thing about this is I had no idea. I mean, I have no idea how much people study for my class. And I don't think students have any idea how, many, how much time other students study for their class. Because a student will tell you, well, I study three hours and feel like that's a lot. All right, so the use of laptops. So I'm curious about what's happening with laptops. And so I, I took the people who consistently use laptops. And I want to emphasize that this isn't using lecture tools. This is just people bringing laptops for their own purposes. And these are items where if people endorsed that they did these things almost always so on the Likert scale, um, you know, so it's actually a correlation. But people did poorly if they tended to endorse these things. And what I had thought was that, well, maybe it matters what you do on your laptop. But um, it really doesn't appear to that um, people who uh, took notes on their laptop, did non-class activities on their laptop, uh, looked at websites related to the class, so looking up something on Wikipedia, um, um, people who report missing something the professor said because I was doing something on the laptop, um, that's turned out um, pretty consistently, and people who bring it for purposes other than taking notes. All of those things seem to indicate that there's an element of distraction going on, so that if people are bringing laptops and they're distracted by stuff, not, you know, I think it's probably an effect of multitasking, essentially, that if you're trying to do too many things at once, you're not getting the lecture material. Um, but again, uh, this is just leaving students up to their own devices about what they're actually doing with the laptop. And I think that quite a few are not using them. One of the interesting things, however, is that at least in this preliminary analysis, um, others using laptops doesn't appear to bother the people who, or doesn't impact the people who aren't using laptops. So that um, people who said that, who didn't use laptops, um, there was no effect um, to, with exam score by reporting that they were distracted by things other th that other people were doing on laptops or that they found the use of laptops by others uh, distracting. So um, I've been tempted sometimes and I've asked students whether this would be a good idea to divide the class into a laptop section and a non-laptop section. This would suggest that this isn't a problem. Um, something about this kind of these survey elements that I'm concerned with is that they may tap into people who, you know, not so much practices of laptop use, but people who are more distractible might um, report higher levels of these kinds of things than people who are less distractible. And so this is where having a measure of attention capacity or something like that would be useful. So you're saying if you took away the laptops, they would still have these problems? Yes, they might. Well, and in fact, uh, there's one, I yeah, there's one item in this next slide that, that's going to address that issue too. Um, so those are the, the things regarding laptop use. Um, 
There was an indication in some data from last semester that people who had problems on the first exam, if they used laptops less, um, they did better on the second exam. Um, finally, there's some other things that I think are just as interesting as these, these ones that I've just described. And these are sort of things that I just threw in there. Um, some of the motivation ones are based on the work of Paul Pintrich and, and Bill McKeechee here at U of M. Uh, people with higher exam scores tended to report, or people who reported enjoying natural science classes tended to have higher exam scores. Um, people often taking my class say, well, this is more like a natural science class than I would expect in psychology. Normally I do okay in psych, I'm not doing so well in here. Um, people who got higher exam scores tended to endorse this item, one of my highest priorities in life right now is academic success. So um, again, kind of a motivation thing, um, perhaps. Um, I was concerned a bit that I was tapping into, my class has a lot of pre-meds. I would guess that maybe 50% are pre-med or some, some related field. And so I was thinking that maybe with the natural science thing, I'm simply tapping into overall GPA. But uh, I did analysis trying to partial out the effect of GPA, and that one still held up. That wasn't true for these other ones that I'm going to describe. So just to sort of flip the correlation around, people tended to have lower exam scores who endorsed the item, I enjoy humanities classes, and I enjoy studying the creative arts. However, when I partialed out GPA, those effects went away. So. Um, not sure how to interpret these. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned regarding uh, distractibility during class. I often miss important points because I'm thinking of other things. Um, and then some of the more straightforward motivation ones. Uh, I often feel so unmotivated when I study that I quit before I finish what I plan to do. That item was associated with lower exam scores. That was a very strong relationship. Uh, I tend to procrastinate when studying uh, was associated. This is one that's been very strong too, and I'm, it was strong last semester when I gave the survey after students found out their exam score. And so I've been curious this semester when I give this survey before students find out what their exam score, because when, once they've gotten their exam score, they can do all kinds of rationalization about what they did in studying and interpret their exam score in light of that. Uh, but this one still shows up consistently this semester. There were things that came up that prevented me from studying for the exam as thoroughly as I usually do. Um, and then finally, the uh, one that's consistently uh, a problem in the surveys that I've done is exams make me anxious and or worried. So anxiety has an effect and um, again, you know, how these things relate to GPA and some of the other factors, I, we're just the very beginning stages of, of looking at these data. So I'd be happy to take questions or... Bill, why don't you take a couple questions while we get you set? Bill, is this a, is this a survey that you're willing to share that we got all others to try? Um, yeah, in fact, I should mention, I, I did mention that this is somewhat non-scholarly and that I haven't cited some of the f people who've gone before me and created some of these survey items. So there are some of these surveys out there. I'd be happy to share um, the survey items with other people. In fact, I think it would be interesting to see how stable some of these things are across different disciplines. Um, you know, maybe the people doing hum that like humanities do better in humanities classes, um, that, that type of thing. Maybe natural science people don't do so well. Yeah, okay. It's really, really interesting. Other questions?